to lower the cost of everyday needs like health care and housing and groceries. We're going to end America's housing shortage. You just let in over 10 million people illegally and you put them all on housing vouchers and food stamps and gave them free plane tickets and free cell phones and all of them have to live somewhere. You caused America's housing shortage. If you care about the cost of housing, limit the population. Certainly don't expand it through uncontrolled immigration, through open borders, which is exactly what they did. She's responsible for it. And her donors at BlackRock are buying up the houses in your neighborhood. And her donors at Airbnb are turning your neighborhood into a completely unmanageable garbage, a place filled with transients where there's no social connection at all between people. Those are her donors. Those are her policies. For her to lecture us on the housing shortage that she caused, it's almost too much. I, I can't sit here. This is the mortgage debt service compared to income, and you can see that people have some of the most comfortable mortgages in history. This chart goes back to, what, 1980? Look at it closely. Here it is blown up for you. I mean, it, got a, it was a little better during COVID, but people are super comfortable, and they're not selling. Okay, I gotta switch gears. Let's talk about inflation. I told you, I promised you, that I would teach you how to win the game and maybe game the system. Okay, how many of you are going to the casino thing tonight, right? You like to gamble, anybody? This is definitely not gambling. I don't gamble too much, I, occasionally. But this is the way to game the system. You know, if you're gambling, you want to game the system if you can. You know, some people make this really bad decision when it comes to real estate. And they think that the real estate game is about one thing, it's about price, right? The whole game is one dimensional. It's buy low, sell high. Well, that's okay, I'll take it, sure. But that is a really shallow understanding of the way real estate works. Because income property, especially the particular kind of real estate I like, is a multi-dimensional asset class. And there are so many different ways you make money from it. And so you don't want to be that person who just thinks it's all about prices and get too focused on that. But since everybody wants to know about that and talk about that, I thought I would. All right, let's talk about shorting the dollar. So we all know Ken McElroy, right? Of course, he's my business partner in the collective inner circle mastermind that we run. And one of the things I said to Ken a few years ago is I said, Ken, you know, maybe you should be a little worried about my own investments. You know, I've got millions of dollars invested and I am long on everything. I am, in other words, my investment thesis is that everything will go up, right? I'm long, long position, not a short position. And, you know, I'm long on Bitcoin, I'm long on housing prices, I'm long on stocks, I'm long on everything. I'm all expecting everything to go up and maybe that's a bad idea. But then I realized after I said that to him, I'm actually short on one big thing because I think this thing is gonna go down a lot and I'm pretty sure I'm right and I'm pretty sure you're gonna agree with me. What am I short on? The dollar, right? How do you short the dollar? How do you really short the dollar? Well, you don't do it like a currency trader. That's way too risky. I wanna show you a super simple, easy, almost guaranteed way. Almost, nothing's guaranteed. But this is almost guaranteed that you can short the dollar and win. So here it is. These people, or all the rest of them, right? There's Biden and Yellen spending all the money, right? And remember, one of the triggers for inflation is government spending like was said on a panel earlier today, and it's really hard to get your head around this. It took me a long time to understand this, but understand that money is lent into existence. That's the way our super complex system works. The more money that's created, the less valuable the money is, okay? Scarcity versus abundance, right? And so what makes a currency like the dollar or the yen or the euro or the Brazilian real or any currency or the peso or whatever, what makes it valuable? There are really only two drivers of value. Scarcity, it's gotta be scarce to be valuable. We talked about gold, it's scarce. The supply is pretty limited, it's pretty hard to make more, right? It's hard to mine it out of the ground. Bitcoin, 21 million coins, end of discussion. It's done, right? That's it, okay? Scarce assets. Real estate, very scarce. It's hard to make new real estate or new housing, right? It's very hard to build houses. It's very expensive. So it's very inelastic, okay, to make more. But with dollars, you can just make as many as you want, right? 
I mean, I always wondered if, like, when the Fed increases the money supply, you know, do they go to some special corner in the Federal Reserve building, and does Jerome Powell, you know, turn on a computer login, and is it a Mac or a PC? I kind of even wonder that. It's probably a PC. And then he takes his mouse and he says, okay, let's just create more money supply, and all the existing supply of money goes down in value, right? That's what you can be sure of, and this is a pretty darn good bet. Now, how many of you think the country is in kind of a mess right now? Yeah, I think that's a fair statement. You know, it's, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to think things are pretty good, there's great technology coming on the horizon, but let me just mention something about doomers for a moment, okay? Because I am definitely not a doomer, but a lot of people are doomers, and the doomers have the biggest audiences on YouTube, they have the clickbait thumbnails and the clickbait titles, and everybody wants to know how the world's gonna end. Well, you know, as the old saying goes, the world usually ends with a whimper, not a bang, okay? But what really happens here is what the doomers don't realize is the incredible power of all of you, all of us, okay? They don't realize that every morning, and I know they're not all adults, I get it, but every morning, eight billion people wake up. And you know what the currently dominant thought of every human on Earth is? Here it is, I think. Disagree with me if you like. But I think what they think about all day long, it's certainly what I think about, is how can I improve my situation? Okay? Like, how do I get richer? Or how do I get more love? Or how do I have more fun? Or, you know, on the negative side, what if you're an addict, right? How do I get my next drink? Okay? You know, there's all kinds of ways people consider they're improving their situation. They're not always productive, okay? But they think, how do I improve my situation? And thank God that most of the world now lives under capitalism. And the only way someone can legally improve their situation is by improving the situation of a fellow human. And that is an incredibly powerful thing. There's an awful lot of momentum to that that, you know, trumps all the other bad stuff that's going on in the world. But let's look at the bad stuff for a moment. The country's in massive debt. We've got over $35 trillion of debt, and that number is increasing at a trillion dollars every 100 days. It's insane. It's never happened this fast. But wait, there's more. It's actually worse than that. See, that's our debt. But we have a lot of other problems. We have all these promises the government has made into the future. They're called unfunded mandates or unfunded entitlements. And there's a lot of disagreement on how big this problem is, but I've had Lawrence Kutlikoff, the economist, on my show several times, and he's probably done the deepest analysis of this. And he'll tell you that it's somewhere around $220 trillion. You know what I hate? When people talk about these big numbers and they're like meaningless. A trillion here, a trillion there, you know, it adds up eventually. Okay, here's the thing. Compared to what? How big is that? Well, the GDP of the United States is about 25 trillion a year. So everybody's effort of working all year long is worth 25 trillion dollars. The entire planet is worth just over 100 trillion dollars a year. Everybody in the world working and contributing to the economy is over 100 trillion a year. Well, the IRS takes in about 4 trillion a year. The debt is 35 trillion, the unfunded mandates are 220 trillion, maybe. Disagreement, right? But whatever, we'll take that number. How do we ever pay for the problem? You can't, There's, it's mathematically impossible, right? So what can the government do? They can default, they can just say, sorry, we made lots of promises, can't keep them, tough luck. They could say, we're gonna raise taxes. You can't raise taxes enough to solve the problem. They're taking in four trillion a year, the whole economy's 25 trillion. We'll tax you at 100%. You're gonna keep working? Probably not, okay? So you can't solve the problem with taxes. If they taxed all of us at 100%, it would take 11 years just to pay for the unfunded mandates. It's impossible. We'll never get out of it by paying taxes. Okay, so how about a yard sale? We could sell off assets. Remember years ago when they talked about selling the ports to Dubai, right? You know, there, the country has assets that it could sell, it could sell some land. You know, the, the Bureau of Land Management sells off land to developers all the time. So there are assets to sell. Steel, we could use the U.S. military or economic hitmen to go and take the oil from Iraq, right? A lot of people accuse us of doing this. Not really quite true, but you know, that's the history of the world map, is theft, right? 
did you see the Napoleon movie? I just watched that, right? Napoleon was basically a thief with an army, right? That's, you know, that's the way it works. That's how the map got designed, by stealing from other countries. Okay, here's the good news, technological innovation. Maybe some great thing will happen in biotech, AI, nanotechnology, energy, and it'll just make us all more prosperous. And I think this is actually quite true. You know, another one of my sayings, it's an amazing time to be alive. And it really is an incredible time because with artificial intelligence, well, there's a couple big hurdles coming up. So one, you probably saw that movie, The Imitation Game years ago, right? That was a great movie. Alan Turing, this brilliant, brilliant inventor and scientist. So it was named after him called the Turing Test. And that's when a computer can fool a human into thinking it's a human. ChatGPT basically has passed the Turing Test pretty much. Okay? Because you can have a conversation with it and not know it's a computer. Okay? You really can. What's the next step? Artificial intelligence becoming as intelligent as a human. And then Ray Kurzweil talks about the singularity, which is the computer being as intelligent as a human costing less than $1,000. You know, my laptop was like $4,200, don't steal it, okay? A $1,000 computer that is as smart as a human. I mean, humans are incredibly smart, even the dumb ones. Even the Democrats are pretty smart. Uh, some of them, not most of them. I mean, now, Kamala Anderson is an exception. She's really f***ing stupid, okay? I mean, think about it. You know that saying, a penny for your thoughts? If you gave her a penny for her thoughts, you'd get change back. Like, she is so dumb. I can't believe how dumb she is. Go and look up the video of her trying to explain cloud computing. It's hilarious. Oh, yeah, the data goes up in the cloud and rolls around and comes down. <laughs> and, you know, but we're unburdened by what has been. I mean, God. It's, I mean, I'd rather have the mean tweet guy that's orange at the tanning booth, but, you know, whatever. Now some of you hate me. See, she's leaving. Okay, you hate me now. Yeah, I knew it. All right. <laughs> okay, Democrats, get up and leave. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, listen, I like some Democratic policies. I just don't like idiots. Okay, sorry. Okay, so enough of that. So then the next step is the AI becomes as intelligent as you or me, right? And that's pretty incredible. But the biggest one is artificial general intelligence. Can you imagine the AI being as smart as every human on Earth, networked together with other AIs? I mean, this is really... Terminator too. You know, this is pretty scary stuff. And Elon Musk is talking a lot about that. Another Democrat's leaving. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, he got a phone call, probably from Kamala Anderson, or Henderson, or Harris, what's her name? Yeah, anyway. Okay, cognitive decline. I need my AI assistance. So there's pretty amazing stuff with tech, but here's what's most likely to happen. They will just simply inflate away the problem. That's the best business plan for governments and central banks. And it should be your business plan, too. Here's how it works. Write this down. This is worth writing down, okay? To understand inflation, we need to distinguish between real and nominal. Remember the dollar example earlier. The name of it is a dollar. The word nominal literally means in name only. That's the name. But it's not the value, right? So we need to distinguish between these, you know, price and value. Those are very different things. Inflation is an insidious hidden tax that destroys purchasing power. Inflation destroys the value of savings, stocks, bonds, even your equity in real estate. And I like real estate, okay? It destroys that. And thankfully, it destroys the value of debt. Now, debt is my favorite four-letter word. It's a really good word, and you should use it to your advantage. It's a very powerful thing. Inflation is the most powerful method of wealth redistribution. It's not taxation, it's inflation. Because inflation is a hidden tax that very few people really understand. Yeah, we all understand prices are going up, you know, but it's really, there's a lot more to it than that. But here's one thing to know for sure. Inflation redistributes wealth from lenders to borrowers. So this is the game right here. This is the secret. You borrow money in today's dollar value, and you pay it back in tomorrow's lower dollar value. And I call this beautiful thing inflation-induced debt destruction. I trademarked this term years ago because it is the most amazing hidden wealth crater that people don't think about. They buy a property and they think, oh, I bought it for this, I sold it for that, I made money. 
but what they didn't consider is how the value of the debt went down so much. Here's a real world example that happened to millions of people. You don't need to look at every number on this chart. It's pretty easy. Look at the first line of the chart, 1972. Okay, this example is someone buying the median price house in 1972 of just over $18,000, putting 20% down, they got a mortgage of just over 14,000 at 7.37% which was the interest rate back then. I know you think rates are so high now. They're really not, historically. They got a 30-year mortgage. In 1972, how much was a dollar worth? A dollar, because no time had passed. It wasn't destroyed by inflation yet. But by 1984, and if you haven't read that book lately, George Orwell's book, it's all coming true. So read that book, 1984, by George Orwell. It's brilliant. And read Fahrenheit 451 and Atlas Shrugged, and a bunch of other ones. There's a lot of good books out there, obviously. Yes, someone likes it. Who is John Galt? Okay, yeah, that's an Atlas Shrug thing. Only people in the club know. Okay, so by 1984, that same dollar was only worth 40 cents. You're looking at the last line at the bottom of the slide. 40 cents. Now, at the end of the 30 years, that dollar from 1972 that they borrowed was worth 24 cents. This is inflation-induced debt destruction. I want you to look at one other column here with what time I have left, with it isn't much. Look at the monthly payments. And you see how it starts in 1972 at $101 per month, okay? And then it's inflation adjusted. Every month, they're writing a check for 30 years for $101. But over time, don't you think the value of that check got a lot lighter and easier? Sure it did because by 1984, it only felt like $41, even though the amount of the check still said 101. And then by the end of the time, that check only felt like $24. This is inflation-induced debt destruction. It destroys the value of debt. And if you have a lot of debt, your debt gets cheaper to repay. It's an incredible hidden wealth crater. But it happens in two ways. It lowers the value of the monthly payment, but it also lowers the value of the loan balance. They both get cheaper, which is incredible. Think about it. If you go to your favorite website, jasonhartman.com, I know it's your favorite, and you click on the properties page, and you say, I'm gonna buy four properties today from Jason's Network Empowered Investor, okay? And you do that, and then you borrow, say, a million dollars to buy those four houses. Okay, what happens in five years when there is inflation of, you know, real inflation of like 8% per year, the value of that million dollars keeps going down and inflation pays it off for you. This is what it did for millions of people. Here's the actual numbers. 1972, a dollar was a dollar. 1984, it was 40 cents. 2001, 24 cents. They borrowed at 7.37%. So, with inflation-induced debt destruction, their real interest rate was only 1.06%. But wait, there's more. Remember, interest payments on mortgages are tax-deductible. Oh, behave. Okay. <laughs> it gets much better than this. They had a negative interest rate for three decades. They lived in a house for free. They got paid to live in the house. They got paid to borrow the money. Negative 1.16%, and this is a regular homeowner that lives in the house. Imagine how much better this gets when you rent the house to somebody else and they pay the mortgage for you. It's an amazing time to be alive if you understand how to game the system with inflation-induced debt destruction.